Praise the Lord, everyone. I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's all stand to our feet. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise and just thank Him for bringing us here today. God, we thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. God, we thank you today. Lord, you're worthy of all the praise. Sit in traffic for a bit. Come on, anybody else? Pray for us today. And I believe the Lord is our healer. He's our provider. He can take care of us today. And anytime we bring our needs to the Lord, we bring it in faith, believing, and knowing that God can take care of it. And I believe that He truly can today. Amen. Amen. Let's all lift our voices and our hands unto the Lord one time. God, we thank you, Lord. God, for your many blessings. God, I thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're our healer today. God, I thank you, Jesus. Lord, you can touch our bodies. Lord, you can touch our heart. Lord, you can touch our minds today. God, have your way today. God, lead us today. God, let there be healing in this place. In Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. God, we praise you today. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. God, we love you, Lord. God, touch this to Kathy today. God, touch your body. God, touch her today. Lord, help her, Lord, in Jesus' name. God, we thank you, Lord, for your healing touch. God, in Jesus' name, have your way today. God will give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Thank you, Jesus. God, we love you today. Come on, let's sing this together. Sing Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus, and nothing else matters. Nothing in this world will do. Jesus' name, from my heart to the head. 
you love what you feel in the house of the Lord tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, one more time. Let's put our hands together for the Lord and just thank him for showing up here tonight. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. God, we love you today. In Jesus' name. We're going to take up our Wednesday evening tithes and offering. So thankful to be able to do that, be able to give back to the cause of Christ and the building of his kingdom today. Amen. Amen. So thankful for the presence of the Lord. So thankful we're able to give in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. We've got some special speakers today. So thank you, Brother Brad, Sister Melissa. They'll be teaching to us tonight. So thankful for their ministry, everything that they do around here. They're just great, wonderful people. Amen. Amen. Let's lift our voice one more time to the Lord. Pray over this offering. God, we thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. God, we thank you, Lord, for your touch here tonight. God, have your way. God, bless this offering. Bless all. Bless those who have to give and those who have not. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. God bless you as you give today.
needed today. We have Brother Brad, Sister Melissa to teach them to us. I'm looking forward to what the Lord has in store for us. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. You know what, Brother Wayne? Can we have that mic, too? Amen. Praise the Lord. I can promise you one thing. I'm more nervous today than I have been in a long time. And that's I'm not making that up. I know her way too well. And for some of you that know her, well, let's just say you ought to all be very nervous right now. Amen. Thankful to be here in the house of God. Thankful, thankful Pastor trusts the microphone to us and uh, that we can be used for his kingdom and, and, uh, and hope that we, we edify the body. Hope that we, we edify the body of Christ. And uh, thankful my buddy and his wife showed up to come here. I guarantee Brother Jared didn't come to hear me and Sister Susan didn't come here to me. As soon as I said Melissa, he goes, I'm coming. He goes, I cannot miss this opportunity. So... No, we, we, we love being here. Um, remember our pastor, he's traveling. Rem- uh, just remember him in your prayers in the morning. And when you go home at night, just, just speak the name of Jesus over our pastor and his family just to protect him. And uh, we love when he takes vacation, he gets refreshed, he comes back to the house of God. And there's always something fresh that he brings back when he comes back to preach. So, so just pray for them that they, uh, that they can enjoy their time, have a good time. We know what, what this is. This is uh, family matters. Family matters. And so Pastor just said, you teach about whatever you want to teach about. And I know they've kind of had a structure on, on what they wanted to teach. So uh, tonight we're going to talk about following Jesus as a family. I hope that's appropriate. Following Jesus simply as a family. So I hope what we bring out to you is uh, we'll, we'll lift you up and, and the Lord's pleased with it. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, if you have your Bibles. Matthew chapter 4, I'm going to start with uh, verse number 18. Just going to read a couple scriptures. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 4, starting at verse number 18. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. Verse number 21. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them. In verse number 22. And immediately left their ship, and their father, and followed him. Immediately, Simon, Peter, and Andrew dropped their nets to follow him, and immediately James and John, the sons of Zebedee, dropped what they had to follow Jesus. The first men called to Jesus in the Bible, took the calling of the Lord very literal. The book of Mark, if you read it, you don't have to turn there, but it records it almost identically the book of Mark. The book of Luke, however, goes into a little more detail about the miracle and talks about the miracle when Jesus said, cast out a little deep, Peter, and said, cast your nets on the other side, and they dropped, and such an overwhelming amount of fish came into the boat that almost the boat couldn't contain it. And the Bible says that Peter fell at the knees of Jesus, and he actually said the words, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. So that tells us a little more about what's going in the mind of Peter at that moment, because At that moment, he knew that this wasn't just another man that came by the sea that day. The scriptures in in Mark and Matthew said, Jesus walked up to him and said, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And they dropped their nets and followed him. But in Luke, gives a little more detail about the situation about Peter. It also talks about Zebedee. Zebedee was a a partner to Peter in the fishing industry. Luke, Luke talks about it. 
So we wanted to bring this, these first men out, that the first men that were called to Jesus, because they, they probably relate to us in today's time even more than we, we realize. These men, Simon Peter, his brother Andrew, uh, James and John, Zebedee, they probably relate to us a little more than we realize. And so I want to ask this question just so you have this question in your mind as, as we're teaching up here. What in your mind, what does it look like to follow Jesus? If someone said, are you a follower of Jesus? What would your response be? How does that look to you? What's the, what's the, the picture that paints in your mind as that question is asked? Because the examples I gave were men that literally dropped everything they had and they began to physically walk with Jesus. Amen. That was the example I just gave. But in today's world, how does that look to us? And we're talking about, we're talking about following Jesus as a family. Following Jesus as a family. But there's more to the story than I just read. I, 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 I read in Matthew. I told Mark was basically identical. I read a little bit in Luke, but there's really more behind the scenes. It's important to understand that Peter, Peter was married. Peter wasn't just a man on his own. So we're going to talk about that. Okay, so we're going to talk about Peter's wife. And I'm going to, reading, I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 8, verse 14 and 15. Verse 14 says, And when Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. Chat, or verse 15 says, And he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she arose and ministered unto them. Now the Bible doesn't give a name to Peter's wife, um, his better half, but we know he was married because the verse mentions that he had a mother-in-law. There isn't much written about her in the Bible. We do know that Peter was traveling with Jesus for about, let's say, three years. The Bible doesn't say this, but I can imagine Peter being gone, ministering with Jesus for a few weeks, maybe even a few months. Um, and he would come back home and visit his wife and family, maybe uh, gather up some more supplies and, and rest. And he would be there for a short time, and then he'd be off and, and traveling again. And it was such a different time back then. Um, they didn't have, this is before cell phones, this is before Life 360. Peter's wife couldn't just go on Life 360 and kind of snoop and see where Peter was, what city he was visiting this time, um, if, and, and if he was on his way back home. She had to really rely on her faith to know that God has everything uh, in control and that he was doing the will of God. I'm sure she took care of the home too, but she didn't just let it be a mess. I'm sure she kept it up. Uh, she cleaned. She um, had to prepare dinner. And maybe she even worked out of, uh, out of her home. And I'm sure she did a lot of praying for her husband and for the disciples. And I remember being a young wife and mother and Brad uh, would have to travel for his job back then. Um, he'd be gone sometimes a week at a time. And I was a young mother. I just had Emma. And I did not like that. I missed him so much, and I was so lonely, um, but I still have uh, responsibilities. I still had to clean my house. I had to do lots and lots of laundry, because when you have a baby, there's a lot of laundry to do, and I still had to uh, uh, do, um, uh, make dinner for myself, and um, I just really missed uh, him back then. Well, I still miss you when you're gone, but... <laughs> And so uh, I, I had to hold down the fort, but I did a lot of praying uh, then for, for Brad, that the Lord just keep his hand protection on him uh, while he travels. Um, but I can only imagine uh, how an evangelist's wife feels. Her husband's traveling across the country. Uh, she doesn't always get to go with her husband. Maybe uh, her kids are sick. Maybe she, um, her kids have school. Maybe she's taking care of her elderly parents, um, etc. But she is just as much a part of her husband's ministry, okay, she is just as much a part of a husband's ministry, working for the Lord uh, through her prayer, fasting, and everyday walk with the Lord. Ladies, maybe your husband isn't an evangelist or a foreign missionary, or maybe he really, maybe he's really involved in church. He's a Sunday school teacher. Um, he might be part of the praise team, or he might uh, be involved in the food pantry which might cause him to have to spend extra time at the church or time studying for his lesson. The Bible says that uh, when you become married, uh, two become one flesh. 
That means whatever your husband is a part of, you are a part of that work also. Whether you are right there with him or you are working behind the scenes. Right. So there's, there's always more behind the scenes. There's always more to the story when someone's up there and the man has a word of, of God or the woman has a word from God and, and they're up there. There's always something more that built up to that moment. It's always not just, of course, a pulpit moment. A moment. It could be a variety of things, but there's always more behind the scenes. And the other two men that, that were called with Peter were James and John, the sons of Zebedee. So we just spoke about Peter, and now understanding, of course, he was married and what that situation might have been like, having very little information in the Bible. James and John, of the sons of Zebedee, almost every account in the Gospels they were referenced as the sons of Zebedee. Almost every account in the gospel, if you read it, they were referenced as the sons of Zebedee. Mark chapter 1, verse number 20 says that Zebedee had hired servants. So not just his sons, unless they counted his sons as hired servants, but they had hired servants. And we know that from the book of Luke that they were partnered with Peter and Andrew in the fishing industry. So there's some things we can assume from Zebedee, their father, that uh, he, there was some sort of business entity, probably had multiple boats, okay? I know one scripture says there was two boats. I don't know if P, that was Peter's boat and, and uh, Zebedee's boat or if Zebedee had two boats, but we know there was multiple boats. So in some form, he was probably a man of some sort of wealth, at least maybe upper middle class, the man Zebedee. So let me try to paint a picture. We talked about Peter. We talked about John and James, the sons of Zebedee, their father. They were called and pulled away from Jesus. So let me just, if I can, try to paint a picture. Andrew, the brother of Peter, Andrew was a follower of John the Baptist. He was a disciple of John the Baptist, the Bible says. In fact, it says that Andrew was there when Jesus was baptized by John, when John said, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Andrew was there to witness that. So now you take Andrew, who goes back to his brother, and when you're in the fishing industry, if you can imagine, it's not in today's world where they have these big, large boats where there's 20 people on a boat fishing. These are probably smaller vessels. You're very intimate with each other for a long period of time. A lot of times you fish at night, early in the morning. You're sitting there being quiet. You're talking. So imagine Andrew is is telling his brother all about the situation. I, I, I saw this man, and I'm telling you, He's not just a man. There's something. John said he's the Lamb of God. John said something. But also James and John were part of that too. Keep in mind, James and John Zebedee and Zebedee were part of the partnership with Peter and Andrew. So they were all together. They shared the fish. Maybe you go fishing over here, you go fishing over here. So if I can paint that picture for you, understand that Andrew was essentially preaching to them before Jesus ever came by the beach before he ever came by and saw him on a boat. If you just put that in your, in your mind. So my question is, when the Lord said, and the Bible very specifically says he called them, and James and John left their father and followed Jesus. My question is, was Zebedee not asked to follow Jesus? Was maybe his heart not right? Was he not in a spiritual position and the Lord knew that uh, he wouldn't be right? I, I don't I really don't think it was a spiritual situation because the truth is Simon said, depart from me because I'm a sinful person. Peter knew I'm not right standing in front of this man right now. So I don't think that was the case at all. I think there's some things we can look at to kind of build the, build the story. I think Jesus knew, well, he's God, I'm sure he knew, that literally walking with him was a young man's game. Okay, it was a young person's thing to say, Let's walk for the next three years. You're going to be disciples with me. Understand that in, it doesn't reference the, the ages of every one of the disciples. But if you kind of correlate when they died, when they wrote some of the books, you can essentially take the fact that most all of them, if not all of them, were for sure younger than Jesus. If Jesus was 30 when he started his mission, then all of them were under 30, which makes sense because many of them were Jews, of course. And Jews would start their... Uh, apprenticeship between the ages of 13 and 15 and by the time they were 30 would be done with that they would typically either be teaching themselves would be the man of the house by that time it's not written in the bible i'm i'm extrapolating i'm trying to bring you down to understand that maybe 
Zebedee just wasn't asked to follow Jesus because he knew, could he handle it, number one? But was there something more important he should be doing while he stays here when I take these young men with me to be disciples, to be my disciples? So I also picture the sons of Zebedee. I picture James and John when Jesus said, follow me. I picture them being appropriate young men, turning around, looking at their father, and kind of asking for his approval. Is this a man I should follow? They were probably younger, and I, and I, don't, I don't want to guess on age, but they were probably younger. Should I follow this man right now? And I believe Zebedee pushed him. I believe Zebedee said, yes, this is a man. Now keep in mind, Andrew had been possibly preaching to them saying, I'm telling you there's something not normal with this guy. He could be the Messiah that's supposed to be coming here to save the Jews, save our Jewish people. So if that was the case, I believe Zebedee pushed him and said, follow this man. He had two hired servants. The business was going to maintain. And in fact, it's very possible that Zebedee said, financially, I'm going to support the situation. And he was a part of the financial support. Please understand, I'm, I'm taking a lot of that. Just take it for what it is. It's just Brad up here speaking. But understand that James and John got up and left the boat. That's what we know. But I believe there's a whole lot more to the story, and, and we'll, we'll talk to you about that right now. So James and John, the sons, disciples, Zebedee, the father, possibly a very proud father, saying, yes, this is your time. Go and, and learn under this apprenticeship. Go and learn under this teacher. But who was Zebedee's wife? We're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 27 and verse 56. We're going to learn about who his wife is, uh, among which was Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's children. The exact. What, what verse was that again? Uh, it was Matthew chapter 27 and verse 56. Matthew 27 and 56. Mm -hmm. The exact or similar scripture is also found in Mark, and it mentions the name of Zebedee's wife as Salome. We know that she was devoted to Christ because she is mentioned as being uh, with Mary Magdalene during Jesus' crucifixion. And it wasn't just her sons that followed Jesus. The whole family did. In fact, she had such a boldness in her faith that in Matthew 20.20 20, it says, Then come to him, the mother of Zebedee's children, with her sons, worshiping him, and desire, desiring a certain thing of him. Verse 21, and he said unto her, what wilt thou? What do you want? What do you want? And she saith unto him, grant that these my two sons may sit the one on thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. She believed in Jesus so much that she wanted her sons to be as close to the Lord as they possibly could, one on each side of him. And I think most of, us, most of us, if not all of us, would share the same desire here tonight. We want our children and we want our spouses to be as close to Jesus as they possibly can be. Uh, being used of the Lord, whether it is cleaning the church, teaching, uh, being part of the praise team, or teaching a Bible study. Salome and Zebedee may not have been one of the 12 disciples like their sons, but they definitely followed Jesus as a family. Right. And, and we know that even the revelation of the disciples, their eyes weren't open until even after the, the resurrection of Jesus, when Jesus went back and said, open their understanding to the scriptures so they would understand why the resurrection had to happen, why they have to go to Jerusalem. So you can understand that maybe she didn't realize who Jesus was, but she knew this was a man of importance. He was a great master. He was a rabbi. Maybe she did have the revelation. There was a lot of people who just followed Jesus because they said, this is the man regardless, and they followed Jesus. So the evidence shows, the evidence from this right here shows that it wasn't just James and John, disciples of Jesus. It wasn't just the father, Zebedee, who might have pushed them and said, I'm going to support you, but I just can't physically, can't physically do it, but including the wife. It was a family event that followed Jesus, that fell and worshipped Jesus. The Bible says that she worshipped Jesus with her sons. It was a following of Jesus. Listened to his teachings, believed on him, 
and followed him. A family in the Bible. So how can that relate to us? How can that time, those people, those disciples that we read about in the Bible, how can that relate to us? Joshua chapter or Joshua says, one man can put the flight 1,000 for God is with you. Deuteronomy says, one can, cha- or, one can chase 1,000, but two can put the flight 10,000. We're talking about following Jesus as a family. And I believe we know that families are ordained by God. God created the family unit. We understand that. It doesn't mean that if you're not married yet. It doesn't mean if you're single that you cannot be used of God. Of course it doesn't mean that. But the truth is, if a family were to bind together, if a family were, instead of going in opposite directions and constantly opposing each other, were to be bound together and be used for God's purpose together, it exponentially multiplies the ability of that family. You might only see one person on a pulpit. You might not see Sister Dana up there very often because you see Pastor. But because of the backing of a wife and because of the support of a children who are not all going in different directions, the man of God can preach to us and we're fed because of it. Because the support of an entire family. An entire family can break down walls in a community. It can minister to different ages because you have different ages. Today's family might look different. It might be a single mom. It might be a a single dad. The family unit might look a little different today, but the truth is following Jesus as a family, creating a unity in the direction that the family pushes, multiplies the effectiveness of each individual person within that family. So the best thing we can do right now, what is the best thing right now if we walk out of this place, if I can just give you a nugget just to walk out and say, this is the best thing, what can I do right now? It's put yourself in a, and your family in a position of availability. Put yourself and your family in a position of availability. That in itself, I believe, is following Jesus. In fact, being available for God to use whenever and wherever is to me just as important as an established traveling evangelist. That evangelist might have a crowd of 10,000 and maybe one, two are touched in that service. We know how it happens. Sometimes the Lord's speaking to someone one out of a hundred in that service. But if you are available for God to be used, he'll have you encourage somebody that was your neighbor or someone in a grocery store, wherever it might be, because they're stressed over COVID. I talked to a lady on the phone today, her, her sister's husband, so her, bro- her brother-in-law, mm-hmm. yeah, her brother-in-law is in a hospital with cancer, or with uh, COVID, and she's a customer of mine, and we have a very per- uh, personal, we have a very uh, professional relationship, and so to try to bridge the gap from a professional yeah, we can take care of that for you. No problem, Kim. Her name's Kim, by the way. She was almost tearing up on the, on the phone from Northern Equities because she's asking me, can you come spray our house and disinfect our house? Because my brother, when he comes back out of the hospital, she's hoping he comes back out of the hospital. How do we bridge that gap? It's being available at any moment saying, Lord, if there's anything I can say at this moment without being pushed, without even be, you know, being... Uh, too forthcoming, if there's anything I can say at this moment to encourage her to realize there's hope in Jesus Christ, use me at this moment. But if I don't allow my mind at that moment to be available because my mind is tied up with other things, then I cannot be used at that one moment for God's purpose. And rather, I'm being used for my own purpose. It's being available, being available. If my girls are available, they might be speaking truth in a Bible study to someone at their school. And so what am I doing? Just like Zebedee, just like Zebedee's wife, what are we doing? Just preach the truth. Push them. Pre- encourage them. Be used of God. Because if they get the glory because they started the Bible study or they spoke to someone and someone ended up coming to church, guess who's standing behind them saying, that's part of my family. Amen. And I'm, and I'm backing up that person. Not in a, not in a proud, arrogant, like, like I had something to do with that, but this is, this is our family unit trying to be used for God. And so I support it. I encourage it, and I push it, encouraging my girls to be used 
for God. We're talking about following Jesus as a family. So if we can get real for just one second, how do you make yourself available? How can you make yourself available? Number one, I'm just going to give two points, Brother Bill. Just two, two points, and, and please hear me out when I say these. Number one, stay out of debt. I'm just trying to be real, okay? Stay out of debt. If you want to tie your hands to where you can't be used of God, be so stressed out because you're so in debt, you've got to work two jobs, your mind's constantly thinking about a side job you can do, you'll, you'll be so tied down to the weights. The Bible says, let every weight and sin set them aside because it so easily besets us. You might, be, you might not be living a life of sin, but you're so weighed down by the cares of this world because you're so in, in so debt, in so much debt, that you essentially make yourself useless to the kingdom of God. The proverb says the borrower is servant to the lender. Another, uh, another Bible, if you want to call it another Bible, says the borrower is slave to the lender. You literally enslave yourself when you're constantly in debt and all you can do is pay off the bills. So please take it for what it is. This is just Brother Brad up here talking. But if you want to make yourself available, don't be weighed down. Do not be weighed down by the things of this world. <clears throat> Number two, Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your, your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You want to make yourself available? Your reasonable services make your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I'm pretty comfortable saying I know what the will of God is for each and every one of us. He might have very specific things. I want you to go here. I want you to do this. But I'm telling you the will of God for each and every one of us is to be used for his purpose to reach the lost. That's his will. But following Jesus means you might have to separate yourself from some of the things here on earth. In fact, I would venture to say pretty much anything tied to here on earth, you're not taking with you, so I would try to separate yourself from it as much as possible. In the spiritual, if God needs you to speak encouragement to a backslider or to someone that doesn't maybe even really know Jesus, he needs someone that doesn't look and doesn't act like the world. He needs someone that looks different so he can point them to someone who's very different. Okay? How can someone expect to receive sp something spiritual, not of this world, when they look and act just like the world? Just, just giving two real examples of if you want to be used of God as a family, separate yourselves. Consecrate yourselves. Give yourself, give everything to God. Everything to God. Following Jesus is, is putting yourself and your family in position to be used for God in a position to be used by God. Separate yourself. If you have to, if you're at this altar praying, if you have to, say, God, here am I. Use me. Say like Isaiah said if you have to. Use the words out of the Bible if you have to use it. God, here I am. How do you want to use me? Use me. Melissa and I uh, agreed a while back. In fact, we were, we were talking about whether we should even bring this up, but I just I wanted to bring it up for this sake that we committed ourselves, if the Lord was going to call us to someone, if someone needed help, if someone financially needed help, if someone needed an encouraging word, if, if uh, whatever that someone you can Im imagine in your mind, or somewhere, someplace, if the Lord were to call us, we'd be ready and we'd go. Okay? We, we've made up in our mind, several years ago, we made up in our mind. I, I keep on telling her that, there's an there's a acre parcel, you know, up north in some woods that the Lord's calling us to. She doesn't believe me. But I, I keep on trying to convince her to, of that, but I, I know it's not the Lord's will right, right now. <clears throat> but it wasn't, but listen to me, it wasn't until the last couple of years that we positioned ourselves to be used of God. We had our minds made up. We said it over and over again. 
when we had prayer at our house or if we were just sitting on the couch. We would remind each other and just say, if the Lord said, You've got, we need you here. Now understand, when I'm saying that, I'm saying that prayerfully. I'm saying that I'm going to talk to my pastor. I'm saying that oh, there's a whole lot more to that word, okay? So just understand what I mean by that. But if the Lord called me and said, you need to take your family here, that we would be ready to go. But we weren't ready to go. We were tied down. 2008 happened. We had a house. That house all of a sudden became worth half of what it was. All of a sudden, I'm buried in debt, thinking, I, well, there's no way we can just walk away from this unless I just foreclose. We, we are not in position to be used of God if the God called us somewhere. And the stress of that situation in 2008 puts weight on your mind because you're in debt. Credit cards, a, a $5,000 credit card balance doesn't really look like that much because you owe 70000 on a house that's undervalued that much. So you almost devalue your own self, and so debt piles itself up. Okay, I'm just, just trying to be real. If you want to be used as a family for God, position yourself to be used as a family for God. We had to make sure we weren't so busy, so we, we stopped, uh, or we didn't want to be so busy that we can't stop what we're doing if we needed to help out somebody in a situation, whether it's a missionary financially or it's a friend that says, hey, can you come over and help me? We wanted to be ready just to help. That's where we position ourselves, and we wanted to make sure we weren't in debt. We positioned ourselves. Following Jesus as a family means you're all in. Push your children to follow Jesus. Push them to be used by God. But don't sit on a sideline. Don't think that Zebedee and, and Salome, if that's how you pronounce her name, don't think that we're sitting on the sideline. They were following Jesus. But, Brother Bill, were they actively walking everywhere Jesus walked? Maybe they didn't physically walk everywhere Jesus walked. But when Jesus was in town, in the physical, they were, where, they were at where Jesus was at. When church was open, they were, where, they were at where Jesus was at. That's proper English. I don't know. <clears throat> we have a sign at work that says, um, be the reason people stay. It's a pretty cool sign. Sister Kara, I think you typed it up. Be the reason people stay. It's, it's to our leaders telling people, be the reason someone stays at Sabre. But I, I thought about something for church. Be the reason someone wants to know more about Jesus. Be the reason. It, it might be because you look different. It might be because you talk different. I hope both. You act different. I hope so. But be the reason someone wants to know more about Jesus. And they're willing to give you just a moment in time, in time to speak to them. As you open up, if we're talking on the phone for, with someone, they're willing to give you that moment in time because they trust the, on the other end of that phone or they trust the person they're looking at in front of them as maybe something not of this world. If you think about when Jesus walked by the boat and said, come follow me, I'm going to make you fishers of men, they dropped everything they had to follow a man, which maybe they thought was just a great teacher, maybe they thought was a rabbi, or maybe they realized this was a man of God and was not of this world. Position yourself to be used of God. Position yourself to be used of God. Um, I'll be wrapping up here, Brother Wayne, in just, just a second. There were, there were 12 disciples, but after the resurrection, he visited over 500. We know 120 devoted followers were in the upper room. So maybe 12 men received the limelight and were in the limelight quite often. But we know that their families and many other, others were true followers of Christ at that time. And so we can directly relate that to us. Where not everybody is the pastor preaching from that pulpit right there. But we know behind him is a family that supports him. And we know behind that family are men and women of God in this church as families supporting them. The bills wouldn't get paid if Sister Lana didn't pay the bills. The money wouldn't be deposited if Sister Amanda didn't deposit the money. The MC wouldn't happen if Brother Matt didn't grab the microphone. And it is a family, not just in the literal sense, but a family of Christ in this church to be used of God for our community. If we can take that literally and understand that we are brothers and sisters in Christ, that we as family can make more of a difference in this community than one of us going out and just preaching. 
understand what we can do as a power together. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's all stand. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of, of praise and thank you for allowing us to be here. Thank you, Lord. Bless your name, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Bless your name, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. God, be merciful, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Bless your name, Lord. I think it's appropriate that we, we have altar call just like we would any other service. If you come up here and pray, you make your way forward. Pray, pray for God to use your family. Don't just pray for yourself, God, use me, but pray for your family. and Say, God, use my family collectively as a strength for you and for your purpose. Amen. These, these altars are open. Let's pray and worship the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Bless your name, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Take my hands, Lord, take my feet. Touch my heart, Lord, speak to me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Lord, if you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord, take my feet. Touch my heart, Lord, speak with me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Lord, if you can use anything, Lord, you can my heart, Lord, speak to me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Say, if you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you Touch my heart, Lord, speak to me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can Lord, take my feet, touch my heart, Lord, speak to me, if you can use anything, Lord, you can use me, if you can use anything, Lord, you can use me, if you can use anything, Lord, Lord, take my feet, touch my heart, Lord, speak to me, 